My family's always loved music. There's been music in the house since my earliest memories. My mother was a singer and a high school music teacher, and my father played viola and violin as a very accomplished amateur. His friends used to come over on weekends and read chamber music. Music was just, just central to my existence from, from the word go, I think. I found the cello through the local cello teacher, Steve David. He would come over and read chamber music with my dad and, and his friend on the weekends, and I just loved the fact that his instrument was way bigger than my dad's viola. I would sometimes sit on the floor underneath the dining room table and listen to them reading music. I could feel the vibrations of the instrument through the floor, the, the depth, the, the, the bass, the fact that it could sing in the tenor register, you know. Just everything about the cello was just very, very cool and, and attractive to me. I never felt that I was destined to become a professional musician, but I felt that that was a world that I desperately wanted to enter. I would sit and look at the covers of records of LPs that my dad had, uh, and it was through those LPs that I got a sense that there was this magical world of classical music. I'd never for a minute when I was a kid thought that I could be part of it professionally, but, but it, I knew that it gave me great joy. At the age of 13, I went to the Menuhin School, and that really changed my life. The next five years were absolutely formative and essential. It was a small boarding school, 48 students in all, and the emphasis was on developing one's technique as an instrumentalist, but also on becoming a chamber musician, becoming a great listener. Almost by stealth, actually, that gave me a sense that I was coming into the profession. I think really it was only at the end of my time at the menu in school, I guess when I was 17 going on 18, that I started thinking about the outside world and oh gosh, what am I gonna do next? One of my teachers at that time just said to me, he said, just don't worry about that, Paul. You're, you're gonna make a living as a musician. This was a real light bulb moment for me. After those words, I felt really quite sort of freed and ready for the next stage in my life. Due my last year at the Menuhin School, I became a little bit obsessed with conducting. I then went to Cambridge University and thought that that would be where I would develop more as a conductor. It, it didn't work out that way. I, I, I felt that I really missed the cello and I didn't finish my degree. Went back to London and found myself basically on my own, having to fend for myself. I knew that I didn't want to go back home, but I had to find rent, I had to find somewhere to live and I had to find something to do. So along came a job at the BBC Symphony Orchestra, it was co-principal cello. I applied for it, not thinking I'd get very far. Actually, I was wrong, I ended up getting that job. And then very soon afterwards, I think within a couple of months, the principal cellist left and I got his job too. So I found myself at 20, principal cellist of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Being principal cello of the BBC Symphony Orchestra at such a young age was an extraordinary education. It taught me how to be quick, efficient, how to absorb new music. It taught me about other instruments, about wind instruments, brass instruments, percussion, the whole sort of colour of the orchestra. Plus, I got to sit six feet away from some really legendary conductors. It reawakened that little fire I was absolutely ready to start conducting then. I thought, well, you know, at some point I'm going to have to leave the orchestra, which also meant leaving <laughs> a, a nice regular paycheck. At that time, the Nash Ensemble, a small mixed chamber group in London, they were looking for a cellist. So I jumped into the sea of becoming a freelance musician again. Fairly soon, I was, you know, busier than I'd ever been and exploring amazing chamber music repertoire with the Nash Ensemble. Because the Nash Ensemble had a less onerous schedule than the BBC Symphony Orchestra, I was able to start conducting again in earnest. I even took what seemed like a rather risky decision to enter the Leeds Conductors' Competition. 
and how the heck it happened, I don't know, but I won the thing, which really sort of established me as a conductor, and I ended up becoming music director of the English Chamber Orchestra for a number of years. It was a really, really amazing and inspiring time in my life. It's kind of amazing how life, and, you know, life, of course, but professional life can take extraordinary turns. Being in the BBC Symphony Orchestra, joining the National Ensemble, becoming a conductor, are things that initially I didn't really think I was going to do. Either I wasn't cut out for them or I didn't really want to do them. And then almost as soon as I started doing them all, I found that they were exactly the right thing for me to do. And the phone call that came in 2012, really out of the blue from the Emerson Quartet, asking me if I'd be interested in, in joining, was another thing. It's not that I didn't want to join the Emerson Quartet, but I was pretty happy with everything in London. But of course, the Emerson Quartet meant so much to me. It was the greatest string quartet in the world. I remember distinctly the first notes that I played with the Emerson Quartet. To sit down in what is, you know, basically a kind of Lamborghini of, of, of string quartets, you know, this, this extraordinary organism that's been 34 years in the making was just absolutely thrilling. And I knew after even a few phrases that this was the right thing for me to be doing. When you get to the G and D strings, they can be slightly less colorful than the A, that, but it's got, it, yeah, it's got a good sweep. One of the things that Yehudi Menuhin wrote in the literature for the Menuhin School was that he didn't want his school to be a factory for young soloists and prodigies. He wanted the musicians who went to that school to be equally at home and equally passionate about playing chamber music, about playing in orchestras, and also about committed and wonderful teachers. You know, this cello's starting to sound warmer. It's sort of richer somehow. That's always been at the back of my mind, because in a way, that's what we do as musicians. We're teaching each other. We're, we're, we're trying to get to the heart of whatever piece we're working on. An Emerson Quartet rehearsal, a CMS rehearsal, is as much a seminar as just a practical way of putting a few pieces together for performance. That also goes for the teaching I do at the Yale School of Music, where I've started now as professor. I have a class of, of 12 students there, and every one of them teaches me something every time that I meet them for a lesson. At the end of a long and illustrious musical life, Pablo Casals was asked why he continued to practice the cello every day into his 80s and even into his 90s. And his response to that was very simply, he continued to practice because he could still discern some improvement every day. That sentiment is inspiring to me. It's, it's fundamental to me because I also feel that compared to the extraordinary body of classical music, which I've been in love with from the earliest age, I am very, very small. I'm in the foothills of that extraordinary range of mountains. And that's a very reassuring thought because it means that I can continue exploring it with joy for the rest of my life.